our commenters beat us to the punchline on this one. I wonder why they put huge wads of pre-chewed gum on this card. One wrote of the RTX 2060 KO's double-stacked 9mm thermal pads. Following our interesting discoveries of the RTX 2060 KO, a card which features a fused down RTX 2080 die wherein Nvidia accidentally forgot to turn a few things off, we wanted to look more into the actual quality of the 1660 supercooler that was tossed onto a higher end GPU. In this benchmark, we'll be focusing almost entirely on GDDR6 thermals for components under those 9mm tall thermal pads, or well, two of them that total that, by using hand placed thermal couples across the board. We'll also look at noise numbers and the vBIOS default profiles and temperature targets to determine whether EVGA used peppermint or spearmint thermal pads and for how long prior to application they were pre-chewed. Before that, this video is brought to you by Thermal Grizzly's Conductonaut Liquid Metal. Conductonaut is what we've used in all of our liquid metal and D-lit thermal tests, capable of dropping CPU thermals significantly when replacing the stock thermal interface. Lower CPU thermals don't just allow better overclocks, but also lower noise levels because the transfer efficiency is increased. The mix of gallium and indium makes for a thermal conductivity of 73 watts per meter Kelvin, outclassing traditional pastes significantly. Learn more at the link in the description below. It was a pretty good comment, to be fair, and we did laugh at that one. So the 2060 KO uh, should be pretty well known at this point. If you don't know why it's actually kind of special, unlike any other 2060 on the market, it's because it's got the TU-104 rather than TU-106 die. It's TU-104-150, and this difference is what makes the KO accidentally oops a lot better at things like Blender and uh, significantly better at some specific applications that we tested in the professional space. So uh, it, it was an interesting card and NVIDIA legitimately did just let this one slip through by accident and it's probably not going to change. Meaning the, T, the higher end 2060 dies that are fused down versions of the 2080 and technically slightly larger in surface areas, about 100 millimeters squared larger, uh, those will as far as we know, remain the same. NVIDIA is not supposed to be turning those features off that it accidentally left on when fusing off the parts. So uh, one quick thing I want to address before getting to the thermals on this, which is, of course, the most interesting part of this story. The quick thing is that uh, the story got some legs and it did take off a bit, which is really cool. People covered it and reported on our reporting. One downside of that game of telephone is that a couple of the websites did sort of maybe mishear something we were saying, which is that specifically the 2060 KO is, as far as EVGA has told us, guaranteed to have the die that was in it in our 2060 KO deep dive where we made that discovery. That's not supposed to change. EVGA is specifically using the newer 2060 that's a fused down version of the 2080. It's not a lottery. I saw some websites erroneously reporting that we said it was a lottery. If you watch the video, that is not even close to what we said. What we said is that the 2060 KO will have that GPU, period, and that it's the other card that might be a lottery, the other 2060s, unless a manufacturer says, we are guaranteeing to the best of our ability that card X has this new die, uh, it is a lottery of just whatever Nvidia sold to them for a 2060 at the time, because they call both the original 2060 and the new 2060 a 2060, even though it's two different dies. So the only part that's a lottery is if you buy cards that don't specifically have confirmation from media or the manufacturer what dies in there. And we did get confirmation in that video that the newer of the two dies is in this one. So I wanted to correct that from our peers because people didn't seem to quite get that part and it is rather important to the story. All right, so used chewing gum thermal pads. We've seen this before on EVGA's coolers and some of the teardowns, but basically what they've done is uh, it is a bit annoying because it's, a cost down measure. It's, it's obviously meant to save some cost. It's so that they don't have to redesign a cooler. And what you end up with is a pretty basic cooler that's been on several of the lower end EVGA cards now. It works fine overall, but you start scaling it up to these higher end devices like a 2060. And what happens is EVGA has to find ways to get everything to fit together without making new tooling or redesigning the cooler to more appropriately accommodate the placement of the components on the PCB. So what they've done here to get everything lined up is they've double stacked thermal pads. They're not even really technically centered, but they're mostly there. So the right side of the GPU has a large four or five millimeter thermal pad. And then on top of it, there's another one totals about nine to 10 millimeters of thermal pads. And that is, if you don't know, suboptimal. 
very basic lesson here, but I think everyone knows this who's watching our channel. But if you don't, that's cool. Uh, you want as little of an interface as possible, for the most part, between the device you're trying to cool and the cooler itself. And in this instance, thermal pads are going to have significantly worse thermal conductivity. They are not really meant to be the cooling device. They're meant to be a transfer medium, hence TIM, as often the, uh, the acronym for thermal interface material. So what's going on here is there's a hell of a lot more thermal interface than should exist between the silicon component, which is a flip chip BGA package for GDDR6, uh, and then, of course, its subsequent uh, exterior packaging or case, the, the black module that's on the board, and the actual cooler itself, which is, in this instance, going to be either aluminum fin stacks or bits and pieces of the copper heat pipe, depending on where the particular, uh, at what point you're looking at the thermal pad. The stacked portion's only in the sort of off-center, and it's not the entire length of the thing. The memory module on the lower end of the card towards the PCIe slot only uses one thermal pad. It is still very thick to the extent that it really should be improved. The UGA should try to bring this cooler down closer if it can, but uh, it's got two benefits to it. One of them is that there is a thermal pad on the exact opposite side of those modules that sinks into the backplate. So EVGA is doing well to actually leverage its backplate. A lot of companies don't do that. And the other one is that, uh, the other note anyway, is that because those memory modules are close to the PCIe slot, they're pretty much always going to be warmer. Components close to the PCIe slot run hot because since this is a, uh, it, well, in this orientation anyway, it's top down fin orientation where it's going like that, the air is going to exhaust either down or up and well both really but when it exhausts down it's hitting a motherboard it's getting sort of trapped and some of it will recirculate so devices down here towards pcie slot will always be warmer now the question is is it warmer than the double stack thermal pads and so what we've done is we've lined up three probes we have one that's down here on the bottom right outermost vr or vram component uh, just below the GPU and to the right, towards the PCIe slot. We have another one that is on its immediate neighbor to the right, towards the PCIe slot, but is cooled by the double stack pads, uh, although that one specifically is directly under a single pad for that portion. And then finally, our, uh, our next module would be the one that's up a bit more. It's away from the PCIe slot. It's going to be cooler, but it is directly under the double stacked thermal pad. So that's the one we're most interested in and that's probably enough to get started for the testing. So let's get into the benchmarks. We'll get thermals, noise toward the end. Of course, quick caveat here, because NVIDIA restricts access to the sensors that are actually in the GPU, in the GDDR6 rather, we are using thermocouples. They are perfectly inaccurate, meaning that the inaccuracy of, a, of the thermocouples here doesn't change, is not variable, it's fixed and known. Uh, the only thing we're not 100% sure on is exactly the delta between the sensor in the flip chip PGA package and in the uh, exterior T case measurement. But we have a pretty good range and we'll talk about that too. Our testing will first start with the auto configuration as established by vBIOS GPU temperature targets. We also ran the usual 40 dBA noise normalized testing and did some additional testing with an overclock, but wanted to see the baseline set by the auto profile. Keep in mind that we're using thermocouples for these readings as read from the top center of the memory modules. This allows us to keep any backplates on the cards rather than using thermal imaging of the backside, which is useful since half of the backplates act as insulators and thermal traps, and the other half act as proper conductors. We're still not right on top of the memory die, which is flipped chip BGA and closest to the PCB, but we're close enough to establish a reading that is consistent and reliable. The delta is variable, but it's typically about 8 to 10 degrees Celsius between the package and the actual silicon. With the auto settings, the first chart establishes that the memory modules closest to the motherboard run hotter, unsurprisingly, as there's less passive airflow over these areas. Even still, the upper right position memory module with its 9 to 10 millimeters of double stack thermal pads managed better thermal performance than the more directly cooled PCIe memory module with thinner thermal interfaces. The delta is about 4 to 5 degrees at 69 to 70 degrees Celsius for the more direct thermal pads and about 74 degrees for the thicker thermal pads. Most of this has to do with positioning as being away from the PCIe slot helps and the rest has to do with the fan's ability to push air to the area affected and immediately surrounding each module. So if we could do a like for like test, which is not possible here, and test 
a cooler A versus cooler B on the same memory module, so not different locations on the board, and with two different thermal pad solutions, then we might be able to really see what the, the true difference is. But because we're checking different locations, uh, we end up with a problem where other variables come into play, like proximity to the motherboard. At steady state with heavy load, the memory was more significantly impacted by physical location on the board than by the thermal pad stacking. Although suboptimal and overall a cost saving measure, the results show that the GDDR6 modules are still well within spec. This might matter more if the memory ran a higher frequency or if you wanted to lower the noise levels. So let's take a look at some of that. This chart shows the fan ramp for the Auto V BIOS. GPU temperature is the driving factor for fan speed. And in this case, EVGA has set the target to about 69 degrees Celsius. That has the fan represented on the right axis ramped to about 2300 RPM to sustain the temperature target. EVGA tends to run more aggressive fan targets than necessary a lot of the time, but given how NVIDIA's GPUs will boost higher for every couple degrees Celsius, it's not without some benefit for the trade-off. In this instance, because the fan cannot follow GDDR6 thermals, the side benefit is that it forces G6 thermals to remain well within the sub 105 degree specification. As for how loud that number is, 2300 RPM, we've got another chart for that. This plot shows the EVGA's RPM to DBA response plotted in 5% fan speed increments. These measurements are taken at 20 inches away as is standard for our noise testing and for our noise normalization tests. The card's low end bottoms out at about 1080 RPM for our card. You could bring the card lower, but we lose test resolution below this point for noise level. Electrical component noise, not necessarily coil whine, but just the noise of electronics in general, begins to interfere with test resolution below 30 dBA in our environment. Our noise floor for the room is about 26 dB, which is pretty damn low, but obviously you could go a bit lower in say a semi-anechoic chamber. The 40 dBA mark is about 66%, or around 2050 RPM. We find this is fairly standard for fans of this quantity and size. The auto setting previously shown had us at about 43.2 dBA, so it's leaning toward the aggressive side to maintain those thermals. The question becomes whether those G6 thermals get any more unreasonable at lower noise levels. But realistically, we think it'll mostly be fine. We can step down to 40 dBA to look at this, as this is our standard test noise level, but that's notably not a huge step down from 43-ish. Our 40 dBA noise normalized thermals are next. In this one, we take control of the fan speed and establish an unmoving RPM. The EVGA RTX 2060KO ends up maintaining a lower PCIe GDDR6 result of about 80 degrees Celsius as measured at TKs. This is with the more normally sized thermal pads. So the worst number is coming from something that what conventional wisdom tells us is a bad design. The double stack thermal pad hotspot still maintains a result of about 79 degrees Celsius with the cooler of the two benefited by its distance from the slot, measuring again at about four to five degrees lower. Given that T case is an imperfect measurement and we're not exactly sure what the chip temperature is, and given that the case ambient temperature can easily add 10 degrees to these results, we're approaching limits of what we're comfortable with for GDDR6 thermals. In warmer cases or in higher ambient environments than ours, we would recommend sticking to the stock VBIOS or running a more aggressive fan curve to keep that number in check. 80 degrees sounds fine for G6 thermals, and it is, if we can measure that at the chip level. But NVIDIA doesn't allow external access to sensors that exist on its GDDR6 modules, so we have to rely on thermocouples. Thermocouples are perfectly imprecise though, again, so it's not like variance is a concern, it's just that we're at the edge of the comfort zone here for our test resolution, but the lower module with normal thermal pads is just as bad. For overclocked thermals, we assigned the same fan profile as in the earlier auto test, and maintained about 2300 RPM once again. The result was about two to three degrees warmer in memory thermals, even with the 640 megahertz offset, and so we can't really say that it meaningfully drags down the performance. Overall then, this is an instance where EVGA could absolutely improve the design, and we'd like to see that. The challenge is that the company's trying to do a cost down 2060, and the way it did that was by pulling a 1660 super cooler off the shelf and throwing it onto a 2060 and then restricting the power offset to nothing. So you're 100% power, you can't go more than that. And that's all fine because they do hit the $300 price point and EVJ has apparently enough margin to come down to 280. So as they did when it, when it launched and as they can still do apparently from what they've told us. So the goal was a cost down card and that's what EVJ achieved. Now. Uh, the thermal solution is suboptimal and inefficient, but it actually wasn't outright bad. And given how the thermal pads are stacked on the 
GDDR6 on the right side of the GPU, we did expect significantly worse thermals. Ultimately, you can't run the fan speed as quietly as you could with a more efficient design. So we wouldn't really recommend dropping below the 40 dBA mark that we measured. Uh, at 2300 RPM, the card was doing fine. It was well within spec, even when accounting for the delta between what we can see in our thermocouple and what's probably happening in the chip itself, which will be a couple degrees higher, of course. So if you stick towards that auto fan profile, it's fine. It's really not that big of a deal, and we did think it would be worse. So, I mean, it's good to see that EVGA didn't ship something that just catches itself on fire right away, like Power Color did. But the uh, other side of it is that it is suboptimal. So, if you want to run it quieter, you're going to be limited and restricted there. We would recommend not dropping too low on the fan speeds because uh, those modules close to the PCIe slot are going to run hot. And that's even true for the ones that don't have the double stacked thermal pads, but still have stupid thick thermal pads and overall inefficient uh, cooling solutions for, for what's going on. Uh, a good amount of air does get through the cooler because, I mean, it's two fans. There's not a lot of obstruction between the fins and the PCB. That gets down to the memory. It does help out. And overall, EVJ is in territory where it's fine, but you're noise restricted. So that's the card overall. We thought it would be much worse than it was for GDDR6 thermals. If you're not really planning to overclock, recapping the same conclusion we had before, this is a fine solution if you specifically want some benefits for Blender or some of the other applications we tested with SpecViewPerf and how that applies to your workloads obviously will be more up to you than to us. But if you do care more about a, an overall higher quality cooler solution and the, uh, the, the benefit to production workloads is not meaningful to you at all because you're just looking for gaming, then buy a better card. EVGA makes them, their competitors make them. You can still stick close to the $300 mark, but the better card angle would be more for, uh, for example, either additional power overhead if you want to do overclocking because this is going to be very limited there. You have a fixed amount of power, that's it. You can't push it. Or if you don't care about overclocking, then you just get a cooler that's going to be better optimized for noise normalized thermals. You can bring it down to a lower noise level and maintain the same thermal performance if you have a better cooler. And those do exist similar at similar prices. So those are your considerations. The card itself remains a very good buy if you want something that's shockingly good at something like Blender or some of the, uh, some of the spec view perf workloads we tested. But we'd imagine that market is relatively small at this price point. Most of those users are used to spending a lot of money to get something. Um, so otherwise, you've got options. But that's it. Uh, overall, better than expected. And we were considering testing it with actual chewing gum, but when we asked the gas station clerk which ones were non-conductive, they couldn't help us. So unfortunately, we're going to have to reach out to a couple of bubblegum companies and see if we can perhaps get an answer on non-conductive gum. One of our concerns is that pre-chewing it will potentially predispose that chewing gum to becoming uh, conductive as it heats up and maybe melts out the saliva into the memory. So these are the kinds of things that you come to us for because we're really focused on good testing and obviously we want to make sure we do it right. So that's it for this one. Thanks for watching. Subscribe for more. You can go to store.gamersaccess.net if you'd like to buy something and help us fund our gas station runs where we're going to, I shouldn't say we're going to, where we're going to joke about purchasing thermal pads in the form of spearmint, or you can go to patreon.com slash gamersnexus for some behind the scenes videos. Thanks for watching. We'll see you all next time. <laughs> That's pretty gross. <laughs>